Hello, welcome to this FA webinar, beginning with the end in mind. Joining me for this one, uh, I'm Matt Portis. I'm the uh, FA Education Lead for Physical Performance. And joining me is Geraint Twoos and Joe Sargison, who are both in the professional game team and are FA Youth Coach Developers. Hello, guys. Hi, Hi. how you doing? Just to give a little bit of an overview of what we aim to, to cover tonight on this webinar, we'll be considering um, what elite game performance may look like uh, for our, our developing players at the end of their development pathway and look at looking back at what the implications might be for uh, how, how we might consider developing um, our future players with that in mind. And we're going to, along the way, get some... Uh, insights from our panel this evening of their experiences of working in the senior game but also in development football in, and, and hopefully they'll share and, and shed some light on, on those ideas. To give our aims a little bit more context for those people that have not been involved in the FA Advanced Youth Award previously, um, we'll be also pinning our discussions around the, the four co core aims of that course. So we'll be thinking about the end in mind for the player around the player as the syllabus, the principles of play, uh, play and practice, and also constraints-based coaching. So hopefully that'll help us to, to pin our aims around a little bit more of a focused aim. So we're going to yeah we're going to start off, Grant, with a little bit more uh, background and insight from yourself. I think. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, mate. Um, evening, everyone. Yeah, just to give a bit of background into sort of my experiences and and just to sort of frame up what I want to touch on on this evening. Uh, so I worked at Cardiff City for fifteen years uh, within the academy. I've been at the FA for the last seven years, uh, and in that time, um, I've supported uh, the under fifteen men's team. Uh, and supported the senior women team um, th through the, the Euros competition, the World Cup, and three She Believes tournaments. And I also work as an FAYCD. So i um, really fortunate that I've got a good balance, I guess, in terms of the men's, women's game and, and, and education. And, and the stuff I want to really look into tonight is the balance between the performance element and, and, and the development element and the importance it has on, on player development. And there's times where, where it links. So, you know, we talk about games programs and practice design and philosophies, etc. And, and of course, they should link. But then there's times where, you know, maybe, maybe it doesn't. So when you're looking at an under 13 player at, at, at a club, for example, how you manage that player through the week is very different to how you manage in a senior player. So a senior player preparing to play in, in, a, in a, a game they have to win on a Saturday or, or within a tournament. It's very different to working with a 13-year-old who may still have six years of experience before they get to that stage. Um, and the reason I say that, I think it's really important that we don't miss out on any development opportunities for these players. Just to give a bit of background on, on, the, on the work with the England team, I guess. Obviously, when they come to that stand, it's a very different time scale. They, they're at the, the performance end of the development, if you like. But I think it's really important to note that the mindset of the players is that they're still developing, and I think we have to have our mindset as coaches as well. So even no matter, no matter where these players are in terms of their development pathway, the mindset has to be that they still need to develop. And I have to say the players with with, with the first team are fantastic for this. They, they, they uh, competitiveness in everything that, that they do. They drive uh, dedication to develop is, is absolutely fantastic. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, developing a program within, within academies or, or whether we're de developing players. Certainly with England, our aim is to win, is to win football matches, is to win games, it's to win tournaments, but, you know, it's also to win, win our, in playing our style, and we have, we have great belief in that. Um, and then two other strands, really, which I think are important before I pass over to Joe. All the players um, develop consistently through their IDPs when they're with us on camp, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. And we always look into prepare players for the future to complement the fantastic work that's going on in the, in the pathway. So we want to provide opportunities for these, these youth players to get into senior football 
if you looked at Lauren Hemp, for example, in 2019, she went as a training player on campus, she believes. She believes 2020, she starts the first two games. And that's quite a common trend of, the, of what we're trying to do. We're trying to give opportunities to, to these players to get into first team, uh, the environment, and obviously the physical capabilities of them, is, is, it plays a massive part in it. Great. Just before we hand over to Joe, just just come just clarify IDP you mentioned there, just in case anybody doesn't know what that is. Uh, yeah, apologies, guys. Um, everybody will do this at the club. Just the, the individual development plans. Everybody calls them something slightly different. I, I just got in that mode now. Call them IDPs. <laughs> apologies. Thank you. Uh, Joe, your thoughts and background and insights. Yeah. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, my background, I've had over about 20 years of experience coaching uh, players from grassroots through colleges, university uh, and academies. So I've worked at Forest and Sheffield United through various phases in the past and I've been an FAYCD for almost six years now. So similar to Tuzi, uh, working with, it's been um, across that period, about nine different clubs now across the various categories in the professional game, based based largely up in the, in, in in the north um, and some other international experiences really that I'm going to share with you tonight some research I've been doing for for about eight nine years now uh, mostly in South America some some of the the lessons experiences I've had around uh, what what I'm going to call the mixed game format and something that we can take from youth development in those countries and potentially explore how you can wrap it around our context in um, in the United Kingdom and also some experiences more recently uh, out in, in Sweden with uh, Ostersunds in the Swedish Premier League uh, for half a season on a sabbatical uh, from the FA and uh, working at senior level. And as Susie said, just looking at how uh, starting with the, the idea of the senior game and, and all the physical elements required um, and, and the environment and stripping it down to YDP and PDP and looking backwards at some of the demands that are required to get these youngsters ready for a future in the game. So, uh, you know, I'll... I'll, I'll have a chat with Tuesday and support Tuesday with some anecdotal experiences from from abroad as, as we go through the evening. Fantastic. And my contribution will be adding to those conversations from a physical perspective as well. So, um, if we're beginning with the end in mind, I thought it would be a good idea. It wouldn't be a sports science presentation uh, without a graph, guys. So I thought I'd, I wouldn't let you down on that one. I've, I've put a figure in here for us to to look at. Um, what this depicts, and, and um, it's, a, it's a slide that we use commonly across our, our education provision at the FA, but it just demonstrates the um, evolution of, particularly in the physical corner, of the elite modern game in England. Um, so the, the grey bars on these figures represent um, 10 years earlier than the, the, the black bars. And what what is depicted in this figure is the running statistics that players um, produce when they're performing in the Premier League in England. Um, and what it's quite clear to see is that although the total distance, which is the, if you're looking at the at the screen there, it's the figure in the bottom row in the middle. The total distance really hasn't changed at all. It's it's very very similar. <clears throat> Um, but what has changed in, in, in the game is um, the amount of high intensity work that the players have to do, that the players have to produce to compete in the Premier League. Um, the speed of the game, the intensity that they're running at when they're covering that distance is higher. And the top row in particular highlights what increases we've seen in the um, really high intensity work, so the sprint. Uh, type running so that's kind of any kind of running that happens over 25 kilometers per hour and what we can see is that the number of sprints in total has increased over that 10-year period the explosive sprints have more than doubled and the amount of sprint distances has significantly increased as well so when we're thinking about helping players to reach the end point what we've got to understand is that the end point is ever evolving from a physical point of view as we produce more athletic players and tactics and strategies evolve to for example teams high pressing and being more explosive um, 
then it's going to it's going to affect the physical demands and what we've then got to think about when we go back to development is are we helping the players to bridge that ever increasing gap um and and this this data is it's a it's a it's a few years old now and but what what i can say is um from some data that's been shared recently is um i think there's some teams now in the premier league who's um in within the last season who their sprint numbers the average sprint numbers per game for their players are around 65 um, so again it's probably gone up again in terms of intensity since since this data was produced in the literature um and that, that, that's really significant because you've got to remember that that's average numbers on there. So some of the players are doing a lot more than this in terms of the high intensity work. And how are we through the games program and the training that we do helping young players to, to progress to that? Any thoughts when you look at that, Joe? Does that kind of, is that what you see when you see in games and, and, and what you've seen recently? Yeah, one hundred percent. I think uh, you know, as you said, the intensity is the big one for me. It's you know the transitions, the the, uh, the sprint reps, even when you're in a low block, uh, maybe leaving your defensive line to go and press somebody as the team's trying to break you down. I think bigger bigger areas, third 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 man running uh, players trying to get beyond you into the bigger spaces and looking to play in behind teams. So you know the volume, the distances that a lot of the senior players are now expected to run. Um, you know, re really, really was quite startling, really. So obviously the considerations around um, their development and, and load management and all these things that myself and Tuzi will talk about later. But certainly, you know, got me thinking in, 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 in my own reflections, you know, stripping it back to, you know, what are the um, implications of this for players? Certainly, you know, YDP and PDP in terms of bridging this gap and getting them ready to develop physical physical capacity. Uh, in order to do the, these things that are required at this top elite level, yeah, you teed me up nicely there. To starting to bring it back to the to the uh, PDP phase, yeah, because um, because there is from a physical point of view, there is a, there is a performance gap. So um, if you look at the kind of red bars on the right hand side there, that's just explaining that data on the previous page in in a different way. So this is the average data. So you know, nearly eleven kilometers in distance. 120 meters per minute uh, covered by players in average and obviously there'll be uh, some minutes where they do a lot more than that and somewhere where they do a lot less but that's the average but then that you know that high speed running and that sprint distance it, it is signi significantly high um the other factor to think about on the on the red bars is that you know typically a, a senior first team in the english game could be playing eight competitive fixtures across a calendar month um whereas if we compare that to the green bars on the left hand side um first of all you know, have, you know how often do teams play more than kind of four competitive games uh, i was looking at uh, some some information a, a calendar of a team recently and um across across three calendar months they played the average of two games a month um that was their kind of official fixtures um so but also if you look at that data again it, it just highlights it it's the intensity that's the gap so it's the intensity of how often the games happen but it's also the intensity of play within the games so the distance again yes it's a little bit lower on average for under 18 this under 18 team that we've got the data for here but you know the rate at which they're having to run 116 meters per minute is lower but look at that sprint uh, look at the high speed running distance it's almost half of what the premier league do and it's probably about a third in terms of sprint distance that the demands of the game place on the players so what yeah. are we doing from a physical point of view in training and the games program to help these young players to to bridge that ever increasing gap to the demands of the senior game Thanks, Matt. Um, Matt Rambo, can you um, load up the video, please? So, just going to ask you to observe uh, some video footage here. It's from England ladies um, at, uh, at Swindon Towns Ground against uh, Spain. 
Uh, and ju just watch it and just make some observations, probably start uh, trying to link and connect some of the things that we've spoken about already, certainly there around intensity and and, and, and possibly your observations around uh, the way that the players um, adapt to the different spaces as the ball moves. And of course, observing what the opposition are doing and how uh, the players are problem solving and physical capacity required to make those things happen. So I'll talk at little intervals just to uh, give you some time to breathe but um if we uh, if we start that now just uh, just gather your thoughts england in it are in red in this game So I think early the ball shifted from central areas to wide areas, uh, passes over 30 yards, players willing to penetrate and get into the space in behind the defence, a uh, third man run to get in beyond, and then the desire to get into the area to to actually finish off the the attack. Just things that you you may you may see emerging from this piece of footage. I was trying to see your reaction on the bench there too, is he? But the camera was still out the window. <laughs> this one's interesting here where the players have got a 3v3 in the widest channel. So you think about the, the type of passes now, changes of, of rhythm, short passes, without principle to, to penetrate, try and get behind the opposition defence. But certainly shifting the ball from central areas to wide areas to almost go and gang up on the opposition fullback and get a 2v1. In this sequence of play, you now see quite a few bodies in there, about 10 players in a 20 by 20. And the ball skillfully being moved out of there to then get a third man run or a third player running behind. And then if you look at the wide left player aggressively trying to come in off the far stick. Delayed. So, you know, I guess what's important there as well, Joyce, to think about kind of we're interrogating the game and, and, and the detail that you get, you're going into there when you're looking at that. We're interrogating that with an eye on, well, what are the implications now later on? And, and that's what we're going to get into shortly, isn't it? 100%. And I think um, hopefully as we go through this this presentation and, and we start talking about some of some of our, our own sort of reflections and experiences, um, start thinking about how you can link that to elements of the footage and the observations that you've made there, all backed up by obviously looking at the physical requirements and demands and, and you know we'll 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 look at this and discuss this as we as we continue through the discussion. Yeah thanks mate. I think it's it's important there's, there's two things there really what what Joe will touch on later in terms of the mixed format. When Joe was watching that footage he was looking at it through that lens. So physically, you know, what's going on within the three V three physically what did it take to, to make that 40, 50 yard run um to, to break lines, etc. So, you know, it's important that we, as Matt just said, we look into that physical lens when you're watching the footage. And to touch on this, the, what you were saying, Matt, about um, bridging the gap, how do we yeah. bridge, bridge the gap, you know, physically with these players? How do we extend them? How do we stretch them? How do we make them robust? And I think part of what I want to speak about around my experiences is the individual, um, individual development plans we have for the players, the importance of match day plus one, um, and also, the relevance of, of when you're planning these 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 plans in um and how specific they are to, to the players. But really the underlying the underlying thing I want to go after is when I spoke about the performance and, and, and development model, I guess, is is there a danger at times where we're so worried about overtraining players that we undertrain them? And you know, we have to be aware that not all players need need the same load management. And we, as I said earlier, we, we can't miss out on these, these opportunities to, to develop players and, and, and get them on the grass. So, you know, if I give an example of when we're in the She Believes, we mentioned um, uh, Lauren Hag earlier, 
we took training training players and development players away to the Super League this this year. So they're in a different place in, in terms of players who are going to play two or three games in, in the nine day period. So we yeah. have to find lots to develop them and stretch them. And you know, similar to club football, if you've got an 18, 19 year old who's on the verge of the first team, where do they get that intensity? You know, if 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 do they fall into that performance trap where they you know that maybe they're resting too much? Um, so so I, I think in terms of playing development, this it fasc- fascinates me. One thing I'd, I I I take from my international experiences is the cultures, the cultures of the players and staff, and I'm not just saying coaches. I mean the medics and certainly the S and C staff. In terms of always looking for opportunities mm. to develop these players and, and, and do more work with them, and, and the players want it, and, and 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 the staff want to go on the grass with them as well. And I'll touch on um, in a while about how that can sometimes be, be restricted when you're in 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 within tournament formats. Mm. Uh, but if we just go just go back a slide, I don't know, just click that one. Yeah, just to stay in this one a second. So the IDP programs that we had in place are massively important for us, and certainly in the World Cup, we always found found time. We do every camp really. We always find time to do extra work with these players. Now, for that to happen, you have to have great relationships with medical and and, and, and sports science departments. And we would we would have players working before sessions and and uh, after sessions as well. Um, and that would be you know senior players or or or, or uh, development players. The key to the relationship with um, when you're working with the SNC is, especially in terms of the, the topic of this webinar tonight, is getting the physical load right. Mm. So, you know, you know, if 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 the two players could be played training in the same practice, doing the same things but getting massively different returns, so you might have a more experienced player who needs to be loaded, who might get low to technical repetition, but but, but quite low on the on physical punch. And then one of the development players might be getting high repetition and a high physical return. Yeah. So we have to be quite you know, creative in in our um, in our design the practice to, to make sure we we, 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 get, we hit those targets. But my point being is you have to have those two things. You have to have the relationships with the with the staff to do it, and you have to find time. There has to be that mindset of you want to get on the grass and, and, and work with these players. Yeah. I mean, um, a couple of things resonate there when you're talking around um for the young players, obviously, going into that environment, just the competitiveness and intensity alone is going to kind of uh, probably stress them from a physical point of view beyond what they're they're, they're used to if they training with players of their own age group. So the level of play has gone up, the competitiveness has gone up. So they're going to get they're going to get a physical output from that anyway. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. But then the other thing, on the other hand of that, you've got to think about, well, if they're training, that's great because they're getting the intensity of that. But if they're then not playing in the games, it's sometimes it happens where they'll obviously do the taper sessions that you've got planned with the rest of the squad, but then they don't get the physical punch of the game. And then, you know, and I guess that's when these things like the match day one and finding other opportunities to get more work into the players to help them develop in all four corners, not just in the physical corner, but certainly to get that physical hit is massively important, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, in the, in the IDPs and in the, in, you know, in the match day plus ones, you know, to get, go back to building those relationships with, with your sports science department, you want to get the technical and tactical returns and you want to get the physical returns. And, if you if you're going to get the practice design right, you have to have com- you have to have, um, conversations and you have to pl- plan it together. Um, and I'll touch on that in uh, when I when I when I talk about the the, the match day plus ones. Um, I think the other when we look at IDPs as well, I think you no, know, we need to be really specific when we do an IDPs with the players. So when, whenever I'm working with the players on camp, we're always looking to either develop you know brilliant basics around how we want to play, maybe around. Um, the type of player they are and what they need, and it may be that it's linked to the next game plan. But whatever we're doing, there's always a physical element, and the physical the physical element is always managed and supported by by the sports science staff. And then, in terms of types of players, when you look at physical movements, if you're working with you might have two centre forwards who play differently, score different types types of goals. So you need to design the practice to allow them, allow them to do that. So if you've got a centre forward who loves getting in behind and run, running down the side of centre backs, we well, make sure we put those practices on for them 
so that, so they, they they practice that that's going to help them in the game from a physical technical and, ta and tactical point of view Brilliant. any anything from your point of view joe that's kind of landing that similar with your experiences have we lost him again We'll we'll carry on grant i think joe okay. struggling. he's struggling at the minute <laughs> You just pick back. I mean, just on the match day plus one. So I know Joe will touch on this if he if he comes back in. Yeah. For me, these are so important, and certainly for experiences being in, in tournament football, the match day plus one is the more, from my personal point of view, the most important session on camp. Mm. Uh, because you've got the, you know some of the players who, who haven't played in the game before, they they, they need the the, uh, the physical returns the day after. They are highly competitive. They're elite athletes, so they you know they're not happy. You know they want to train and they, they want to work really hard, but they've they, they've got an edge to them. You know, so yeah. I think how we design these match day plus ones, especially the defense department again, is key. And, and for me, you have, this is a must have in there. It's got to be competitive. The session's got to be competitive. It has to meet the right physical load. It has to meet their individual needs, and it's got to link to the next game. So if we're doing any type of practice, you know, any constraints you put on it, this will be doing this because in three days, uh, Japan are going to give us this. But you instantly get that that, that buy-in from the players. Sorry, Joe, we lost you a minute, Joe. We were just talking about plus one. Yeah, um, 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 it's coming in and out at the moment. No, I think I think all of the, you've covered so many things uh, and it resonates ma massively. I think the big one for me, not to labour the point, was the, the level of competition on match day plus one. Those training sessions were absolutely crucial. Uh, for all the reasons you've given around load management, of course, players are trying to get back in the team and therefore the impression that you create um, around the importance of that day for them is massive. Um, but also all the things that, that you both said that, you know, players are in different places. Some some have had a few minutes in the match previous uh, and need, need probably less in terms of loading and the nature of the activities they can do will be carefully considered and some need, you know, an absolute blast for all the reasons you've given so that they've got the, you know, they're, they're on track to, 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 to play, you know, if selected. And I think the other one um, for me was the importance of communication, you know, from an MDT perspective. So, you know, uh, Tuesday talks about, you know, player, you know, the 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 IDPs and, and maybe helping players understand why they do some of the work that they do from a physical perspective, maybe in the gym, even away from the field. So for, for an example that springs to mind with me that I was involved in, which I thought was fantastic, was where, there was communication between a, a player at the club who um, was doing some trunk rotation work, uh, you know, because he, he had stiff hips and that was the work that the the physical department medical team were were doing with him. Um, and, and and some of my observations were that, uh, he, you know, he's potentially not scanning as much as he could do during matches at key moments in matches and in his position that would help him massively. Um, and then, of course, it's that understanding that maybe his, his body you know, he's, 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 he's struggling to actually rotate whilst on the move. And of course, the departments start, talk, start talking to each other. They put the player in the centre of this experience and explain the reasons behind why you do the work that you do by transferring it to the game. So you put it in a football context, so you get buy-in from the player. So I, I found, you know, that experience of being exposed to that was was fantastic. And the importance of, you know, departments working together to, you know, to, 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 to help the player understand the reasons behind why they do what they do. So. And, and, and to get that expertise is 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 important, Joe. So I I spoke to um, Don uh, Don Scott, who's our SNC uh, leader on camp, around some you know, advice on how we work, and and she spoke about the USA match day plus one, which we recently did, which she was saying was was, was almost perfect for the returns that we got back from it from a physical point of view. It was almost perfect, yeah. and I was happy because technically and tactically we got the, the returns as well. But when Tom talks about, well, look, we need some extensive work here. You know, Matt talked about 120 meters per minute type type practice. So we need some bigger scale stuff in the session. But knowing the game plan that, that we needed going to the next game, we wanted some tighter work. We needed some combination in, in tighter areas. Yeah. So you know, you, you have to have compromise. So we ended up really doing both. You know, we planned a session between us where we would do the the practices linked to how we were going to play, but then it would come out of that. And then do, do do some of the, the slides with Dawn, and then come straight back in, um, and I think those types of you know conversations are, are, are key because you know I think it's important as coaches we have an understanding, don't go and check and challenge, um, but you know we it's, it's not our, our our expertise, and you know Dawn can can when I'm planning the session they can give a real insight into 
whether the sensor is going to be, you know, it's, it's too intensive, it's too, it's too many accelerations, because then it's too tight an area, or whether we need sort of sort of um, bigger bigger space stuff. So the plan is 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 is, is key. It really is. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. And although we might not use language like match day plus one with our our youth development phase players, particularly the early youth development players, what we're talking about here is, you know, when it's the next training match training session after the game what do the individual players need on that at that moment in time right 100 percent, yeah 100 percent. and and again the danger is you know that you know if we're on camp with 23 players and, and and you know 12 of the players have played the game before and up at the hotel getting their recovery you know that the, the other 10 or 12 players we've got uh, 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 need work they, they, they need to be valid you know so we have to get that that work in with them no different to you know, players in in any of the systems in the academies, you're trying to give them the specific loads that, that that they need. I think the other the other key thing, just on the match day plus ones, I think you know it, it is really important to the quality and and, and um, energy and intensity of the sessions was was incredible, and that was some of the feedback we had from the development players. Matt, there, you know, yeah. they, they really experienced that that intensity on, on the match day plus one, which was fantastic. Yeah. Also, from a social point of view, I guess something we got in the in the habit of doing was we'd film the, we'd film the players match day plus one, and then before the game meeting in the afternoon, we, we'd show a little montage to the players who, who were in the hotel so they can see how hard the group were working together. Yeah. And I think you know it's, it's 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 really important that everybody, you know, everybody feels feels valued in that in that process. But again, the for me, the big thing is maximizing all the time we can to get on the grass to, to develop the develop these players. Brilliant. Um, and yeah, in, in terms of you know the tournament football, you know, seeking opportunities to do so. So what, you, you get so many different schedules when you're in, in different types of competition. But with our culture, our mindset of we want to find gaps, we want to find opportunities where we can go and train. So, you know, we work around a match day minus two, three, or, or four, so that when we're on any any particular camp, we can be flexible and adaptable to make sure we get time on the grass. So if you looked at um, the recent She Believes tournament, we were always on match day minus two. Um, we travel from uh, New Jersey to Orlando to Texas in between, so the time constraints were unbelievable. But we still trained. We still made sure the players who needed that extra work at that time on the pitch and mm -hmm. uh, and again linking to you know the, the development pathway coming through you know how, how how can we keep stretching them and keep exposing them whether it's extra training or ideally extra games really you know which i know we'll touch on when when, when, when joe talks and it's about yeah it's about being creative about how can i find that even if it's a very small window of opportunity particularly to get the intensity into the players, isn't it? Because that's the performance gap that, they, that they're trying to bridge. Mm. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I, I think, fellas, just to sort of add to that, uh, kind of linked into Z, it was it's quite an interesting cultural experience for me because, um, you know, if anybody knows anything about Ostersons, it's, uh, you know, a town with a population of about 40,000, I think it is 40,000, 50,000, but geographically it's right up in the, in the north of Sweden. Um, it's only you know a few hours in some respects south of um, you know the terrain that leads to the Arctic Circle. So it, it really is out on a out on a limb in terms of Swedish um, uh, context. So every away game for us during the period, pretty apart from one that I can remember, involved flights. And although they're an internal flights, they generally you had to go through Stockholm and then potentially change it Stockholm to go to Gothenburg or Malmo and and then got on the coach. So, you know, we didn't have many in the period that I was there, we didn't have many weeks where we had double games. But I do remember one week where there was a Swedish Cup game on top of the Al Svenskan Premier League game where we had to take six flights, I think it was, in the space of, uh, it would have been something like maybe four or five days, which was uh, obviously an eye-opener for me because it was the first time I'd ever been exposed to that, but really got me thinking about, you know, flights and preparation and watching how the club looked after the players was, uh, was interesting, really good. Yeah, and just one, one last thing, I guess, before, before we move on, Tori, Mark, just to, to pick your brain really on when we're talking about the gaps with these players' development. So when we're looking at producing these IDPs, it's really understanding you know, where they're at. So, you know, in your planning, are you, are you really looking at a young player who's on the verge of the of the first team? So, you know, mm -hmm. what, what's the bit that's going to get them in 
and, and from a physical point of view, what's the bit they're missing and, and how do we give, we give it to them, you know? And do we frame the IDPs around, I guess, football first and then look what the physical needs are? So, an example that comes into my mind is if, if there's a young player on the verge of the first team who, um, who really needs to, to nail the 1v1 defending to get that opportunity, then do we do loads of work with details and axles and twists in, in, in terms of them, you know? Yeah. But then in a, in a, in a in a similar vein, I guess, in terms of IDPs, you could be working with a player who's an under 14 in the academy or under 12 in the academy. But now you're looking at well, what types of player may this player turn into? Mm. So, if you're looking from a physical point of view, for example, and you've got you know, a midfielder, for example, physically, you don't think it's going to be able to dominate in terms of you know size and build. But, but what could be the, the, the USP? And then you might be looking at well, physically, you may be able to get this player. To be really box the box, line breaking runs, arrive late in the box and be a real threat. So I could, I could build up that sort of, that sort of capacity. Yeah. Um, what was your thoughts on on that, Matt? I think certainly in the youth development phase, you're still trying to think. Well, you, you, first of all, you don't know if the player does make it, where he's going to end up playing, what level, what position, what team, what style of play, etc. So I think you're trying to at that point, you're trying to give them as broader experience as possible, lots of it, but lots of variety within that experience as well, because you then tr you're trying to, you're almost trying to put as many tools in the toolbox as you can at that moment in time. But I think, uh, I think what you've also got to recognize, particularly as the player progresses through the development pathway into the PDP, you know, well, what is that? What is that super strength that's going to help the player to get in the team? And what can we do? What can we do with that super strength to to enhance that? Yeah. So, um, so I think you know earlier on, focus on a lot of things, but also you've got to have half an eye, particularly later down the pathway, about well, how can we really make this super strength even better and stronger, and use it as use it as part of his armory that's going to help him or her get into the team. Yeah. Hundred percent, I, I certainly think of a, of a, a performance edge. It is that one bit now that might get them in from a development edge. Is but come on, what type of player may 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 they turn into? Absolutely. Okay, um, thanks, fellas. I'm just going to share uh, with everybody just some um, some of my experiences, I suppose, and reflections from what's what's almost ten years worth of travelling to countries across South America. I've been mean, very fortunate to. Uh, have been to Brazil um, and Argentina several times in the, in the last decade, but branched out more recently to Colombia and Chile and Uruguay. And it's it's been a really interesting journey on many, many levels, but I'm going to focus mostly on Argentina and Brazil and just want to share with you just some of uh, some of the things that, that, you know, we've learned and been exposed to, you know, the FAs, um, you know, currently discussing um, you know, cu cu cultural differences with with federations, as well as we try and learn more about the game and different environments to help produce uh, better players. Um, so, I think the most important thing here, as we as we as we work our way through this, is to think about um, how we can adapt some of the some of the interesting lessons from this around our context uh, in the UK and within the clubs that we work in, because. You know, it's okay saying that's unbelievable over there. And I love that. And that produces loads of players who are world champions, as, of course, many Argentinians and Brazilians in particular have been. But, you know, maybe it doesn't wrap around our, our, contacts, uh, our context over here because, you know, our kids, our youngsters in YDP, PDP, uh, won't be playing seven days a week, for example. Um, so, so that's really important. And it's in that context that, that I'm going to share some of my, my thoughts with you all now. And I think as well, Joe, it's like linking into what we're talking about. We're, we're looking at this in the context of, well, how does this in the end of in, in the end of the game, how does this help produce to see what some of the things that you've been talking about about the senior game there? You know, we watched the, the senior women's team and some of the some of the actions that we saw that led to goals. How are we helping to develop some of this in the stuff that we're looking at now? Yeah, absolutely. It's almost like crystal ball, isn't it? Looking at the future, going well. If we know what the end product looks like, on the demands of the game, on all that data that you've shown earlier, you know, if we if we could then travel back in time and, and go back to that player's journey through YDP and PDP, 
uh, you know, what are the types of practices and, and exposure to games and the volume of games and variety of games and all the different constraints that you might place upon the games yeah. to help the player develop across the four corners and, of course, build that physical uh, capacity to deal with the intensity that we now, we now know they've got to deal with at senior level. So if you look at the, the top half of the slide, these are just little stills of experiences uh, across Brazil. And, and, you know, right in the top left there, you know, some youngsters playing uh, the national game of uh, Brazil, Football de Salão, um, which is which is almost uh, morphed a bit more into futsal over time. But really, really rock hard clay courts, um, a mixture of age kids on there, uh, improvisation, really, no, no real systems of play. It's all about innovation and dealing with the ball, promotes loads of 1v1s, tight areas. Um, the, the ball's traditionally a size two. Um, and then you've got, you know, a bit more structured futsal, official futsal training sessions in in the box to its right, you know, under 16s, bottom right is a Corinthians under 20s uh, futsal team that played in the Serie A uh, Futsal League of Brazil. Um, and you've got uh, other age groups under 17s below that. Um, and below that right at the bottom is, is from Argentina. So they play a national game called Baby Football, which is 5v5. Again, no systems of play. Uh, futsal is also prevalent there. Uh, but again, this is a Premier League club out there, Atletico Huracan, and this is just their gymnasium, if you like, where baby football is played uh, as, a, as, as, as part of international uh, sport that kids grow up with. And in the top right, on the other half of the slide, and really this is the, the, the point of this uh, in many respects, is that, you know, we also just saw what we see here, you know, kids being, being exposed to playing on bigger areas, 11 v 11s on full-size pitches, different types of standard of grass, some, you know, real, you know, that, that one in the top right, we actually had a cow sat behind the goal, uh, which is quite interesting. I've, I've, I've heard us talk about constraints before, but chipping it, chipping it around a cow is interesting. And then you've got academies, you've got Argentinos juniors, bottom right, you've got Independiente. We've got different, different sort of facilities, some um, hardly any grass, a bit more sand based. Um, and, and lads in PDP just, just get on with it, they roll their sleeves up and play. Uh, and some of that are becoming, the, you know, the grass is a bit more manicured now. It's a bit more typically European uh, style academies, if you like, as, as that culture begins to drift into the country. But I mean, really importantly, you know, some of the people that we've met over the years, uh, just talk, uh, you know, just just talking in um, so positively around the importance of futsal uh, or football to sell out in terms of its natural laboratory. Um, you know, Ronaldinho himself, you know, attributing. Um, so much of what he has in the game of 11v11 to, um, you know, the constraints placed upon him in the tight areas and how that affected his 1v1 dribbling and staying connected to the ball. But some brilliant people that I had a chance to meet, general sporting directors at uh, Racing Club, um, where Simeone was manager, now at River Plate, you know, the cultural roots of Argentinian football rest in this game called baby football. And, and this one for me is the favourite Really, it's the best piece of information I think I think I've taken in the decade there, where the context or the argument is that it's not really about futsal or whatever, whatever national games you want to call it, and it's not really about eleven v eleven. It's actually about the blend of 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 all of those things. It's about exposing the players to different areas, different shape pitches, different numbers that they've got to deal with whether it's a 4v4 in an area that's, you know, 15 by 20 or whether in actual fact you've got the whole of the pitch and one team's in a low block and one team's trying to beat the block and it's to promote, you know, long passes in behind teams as well as short passes around corners, bopping it around in tight areas. It's that it's that mixed system of development uh, that, that they believe, or well, certainly the people I've met, um, is, is, is the key to, you know, this production line of players from Argentina and Brazil going back many, many, many years. Um, so that, that's the context really for the discussion. And, and as Matt and Tuzi have said, you know, see it in the context of the end, the end game being, you know, what we know senior players need from a physical perspective as well. Um, so uh, let me just share with you, um, and the research is ongoing. It's, it's, it's you know, as accurate uh, as it can be at the moment. There will be differences. There's certainly regional differences. The clubs in Buenos Aires uh, have got access to... Um, indoor centres where they'll play baby football or futsal uh, and often that'll be 5v5 um, and then right at the bottom that you may or may not be able to make out and if you can't I'll read it for you in Rosario and Santa Fe which is a bit further in the north outside uh, the metropolitan area of Buenos Aires you know more rural 
uh, Newell's Old Boys is, is an example of a club. Messi is from that area. And they, they don't have access to indoor covered centres as much. So they play uh, they play football, um, baby football, but it's but it's seven v seven. And that they think that that's been the key to their success from under sevens to under thirteens, and would argue, uh, uh, you know, seventy percent of the golden generation of Argentinians over the years, including Messi, have come from that area because it's so fertile for recruitment. Um, interestingly, you know, some of that's changing now, where they're bringing eleven v eleven in at under twelves and under thirteens, and people are having different views on whether or not that's a good thing for them. But I think the the headliners for me here is you look at that timetable, and of course, you'll get more time in your own time to have a look at it. Is that there is a mixed game format approach, so players are exposed to. Uh, two training sessions of futsal and, and two or three uh, club nights of uh, football on grass. Uh, whether it's 7v7 or 9v9, there'll be a degree of independence in the clubs around that. But then the big one for me is that they play two official competitive games at the weekend, one at fut uh, futsal indoors and uh, then an official game um, at uh, on grass on a bigger area. And this will continue all the way to the end of under-13s. Uh, under 14s, as we go halfway through YDP, um, then it will be more a case of a rest day brought in on a Sunday, one official game of 11 v 11, and club training will be um, all geared towards the 11 v 11 game. Not to say they don't play 77, 9 v 9, it'll depend on different clubs, but getting players ready for football. So futsal's kind of put to one side a bit more, same in Rosario. But the interesting thing is that, you know, when you talk to yeah, yeah, your colleagues in, in these in these um, in these in these countries, you know, they'll joke about it, but it's a really important point that a lot of Argentinian youngsters, um, although they're meant to be having a day off, you know, they're playing with their mates in the streets in the barrios, um, are often playing futsal or small sided games, uh, and and you know, resembling what we probably had in our country maybe back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, you know, where they're playing in tight areas, they're they're playing odd numbers. You know, we used to have games like Wembley and Cuppy and all that type of stuff, and they'll have their own derivative of these type of things. So the, the message for me is that, you know, it's a mixture of structured play through different formats of the game, exposing the youngsters to different areas, different shape pitches, different surfaces, different numbers of players to deal with, different situations, all related to the game to deal with. And on top of that, some unstructured play where kids, where youngsters will go off and, and be youngsters and go and try and get some more minutes on the clock by playing with their mates. Um, as we move on to having a quick look at Brazil, again, the picture is emerging more and more. Um, but, um, you know, the, the academy system generally starts uh, around about sort of the age of under 11. So it's more soccer schools, futsal. Um, private soccer schools that kids from the sevens to under tens will join, where where arguably there's more of a sort of pay to play model. If there are youngsters from the favelas that can't afford it, sometimes there's some assistance to try and help there. And then and then they'll start at Corinthians and Fluminense in the north and various other clubs at under elevens. And again, you can see that generally speaking, there'll be things like a two 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 structure, so two um, bigger game format training sessions, uh, where again it's 7v7 they're experimenting with a little bit um in uh, in in sao paulo now 77 and 9v9 there's some research from the federation there and uh you know in fluminese which is in the rio area you know they, they might put their own their own sort of interpretation on that and play 7v7 rather than 11 v 11 but interestingly as things stand we're led to believe that the official competitive game on the sunday is 11 v 11 even at under 11s um, there'll be two futsal training sessions in the week. There'll be hopefully, you know, rest day incorporated on the Friday and then there's an official futsal game on a Saturday. So once again, two competitive games across different formats, uh, limited rest time. And this continues all the way through to the end of under 14s. Uh, under 15s, there's an official rest day, generally on a Saturday, we've been told. But again, a lot of these kids will go and unofficially play what they call clandestine football. They'll go and play for... Uh, uh, a local uh, foot in a local futsal tournament uh, hopefully you know thinking that they're, they're the club that they belong to aren't aware of it so again increasing minutes and um, this element of unstructured play on top of uh, the official competitive nature when you go to 16s and 17s and beyond and it links into pdp then it's more a case of um, and i've heard different views on this it's more a case of specialization it's time to decide uh, and the focus for academies at this point is really football 
11 v 11 official competitive game of 11 v 11 and futsal will be I think they don't do as part of their integrated plan, but uh, there are pathways for players to play fut futsal and specialise in futsal. And actually, you can earn a, a really good living. There's a lot of money in the game professionally in futsal in that country. So we've heard differing views in some clubs um, around about the age of 14, just going into under 15, and, you know, during maturation in particular, um, the club will speak to parents and, and they'll have a discussion. They'll, they'll decide what pathway might be right for their child. Um, but in other clubs, it might be more club led where they'll, they'll say our recommendation is this youngster thinks about football more than futsal. They've got more of a chance at football and, and there might be some physical attributes that lend themselves to playing in, in certain bigger areas or, uh, you know, twisty uh, type agile um, requirements and coordination maybe the better at futsal so as i said it won't be 100 percent accurate but you know we, we're evolving our understanding of uh, what is a, a culture that's very diverse um and, and it'd be interesting to see the future of uh, both countries in terms of whether you know their federations want to standardize one approach so that every club's doing the same thing and, and we'll see what happens as we move on and then the biggest thing for me in trying to bring and make sense of this um, was to bring the research back to England and have a look at the time going back to 2015-16, looking at our context, looking at the clubs that we work in, looking at our environments, looking at how we live our lives, looking at what we can and can't do in terms of load management and, and all the other implications for development of young people, distances, they might have to travel, school work they've got to do and other commitments, was, was looking at the, how we can maybe adapt some of these lessons around that context and also make it user friendly. So, you know, certainly me and Tuzi will testify, you know, for our work as FAYCDs and clubs, you know, sometimes there's there's a lack of access to space and facilities. There's, there's real pressures on clubs to share pitches and, and that type of thing. So, you know, are there ways that we can maybe introduce different formats using the space that you have available? Because sometimes somebody will say, you know, we haven't got a futsal hall. And I think, uh, you know, if you want to obviously model futsal ideally is played in futsal conditions in a futsal hall absolutely but you know there's 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 certainly uh, in my view playing you know five, the derivatives of five the side and back in the day we used to tip up uh, wooden benches in an old gym uh, that had massive benefits bouncing the ball off walls some of you will be using k the cage uh, for those kind of physical battles as well um, and i think it's about being creative and understanding that really the argument um for me, in my mind is more about an exposure to a variety of different sort of environments as part of this uh, thing called player development leading up to the physical requirements and technical tactical um, psychological and social uh, for a senior footballer so this is actually a tournament that we've we've run several times at st george's park and you know if 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 if, uh, if the guys uh, that are listening to this have, have been to st george's if you imagine the inside pitch so it's just the full-size pitch um where you've introduced an 8v8 using the uh, 68 by 43 in terms of dimensions. You might have a second pitch going off there, 6v6, 55 by 30, uh, and it introduced scoring zones there, and I'll come back to that shortly. Um, you might have a 4v4 in there, which is tighter with scoring zones and potentially goalkeepers involved or not involved. You might have the goalkeepers as outfield players if, if you want to get those type of uh, resp uh, uh, responses that you're looking for in the goalkeepers. Um, and then pitch four would be obviously the 11 11 format. And for this particular tournament, we, we split it into four minute, uh, three rounds of four minutes. And we, we underloaded uh, one team, 9 v 11, uh, for three minutes. Then they had a chance to uh, overload the other team, 11 v 9, for three minutes. And then they were balanced at uh, 11 v 11. So you, you can start drip, drip feeding in all these different puzzles that the players have got to solve, all the the constraints you might place on them to to stimulate decision making that they're going to need to survive at the elite level and all the way through the journey at ydp and pdp and of course all the physical responses because if you're two men down you might have to think about either conserving energy and finding ways to stay on the ball and change the tempo uh, or you might think twice about how, how you defend if you've gone on a marauding run down the left wing and you they bounced it round you and now you're down to three men you might have to someone to go and get a press on to buy your time to everybody to get into a low block and then try and contain them so there's an element of stress here but of course there's the stress uh, you know that has to be dealt with in the game of football full stop uh, because of course the opponent's a crucial factor and they will do things to you that you know you you need to be ready for so that you can uh, respond so that that just give you gives you an idea and i'm sure 
you know, many, many of you doing things like this, uh, you know, consulted a lot of coaches across clubs and there's loads of this type of stuff going off around the country, which is fantastic. Um, if you add in things like constraints, you know, when you think about substitute management, when you're doing this type of work in training, uh, um, and, and whether or not you just have the same eight to play the game to the end or whether there's a reserve of two or three players who can come in and roll on and how they roll on and what are they doing on the sideline and are they, are they still involved, uh, getting touches on the ball. Uh, think about your throw-ins. You know, we, we use the three-second rule here uh, to encourage uh, uh, anticipation and reaction and transition so that the, the, the players understood, you know, critical moments where the ball can turn over quickly and they can play. They have to play within three seconds. It seems they need to get set up quickly. Um, you have multi-ball, while well, you might have loads of footballs around the outside, or you might only have one ball, so that players have to go and run off the pitch to go and collect it, largely, you know, like we did, a lot of us during our childhood. So, you know, things to think about, goalkeepers, you know, do you want your goalkeepers as outfield players to develop them uh, around their technical uh, build-up play, for example, or, you know, do you want them in small-sided games where there's loads of transition and loads of shots, so keepers get loads of actions of making saves? Uh, do you want them building the building the attack by being able to play over a range of distances? So you might want them on the bigger bigger areas so they can clip the ball into wider areas and look to go and beyond the opposition as well as play short and build up. So loads of loads of different things there, and and really, you know the the, the point um, I guess we're trying to um, you know examine or the points we're examining today really is, is is like almost like an integration of these different things so yes the mixed game format is is extremely interesting in south america because it's not necessarily our, our sort of standardized approach in our country uh, there's loads of clubs doing some some stuff that's similar in isolation and, and often have relationships between the clubs to, to you know to have tournaments and, and visit each other's academies to to, to to try things out which i think is brilliant um, you know, it'd be interesting to see if we could have a, a more joined up approach on a national basis and actually put a stamp on it and almost make it our culture uh, to help players develop the skills they need to survive in matches through their development to elite uh, level. Um, so skill acquisition and game transfer is everything. And if you think of some of the strap lines of, you know, courses like the Youth Awards and obviously Advanced Youth Award that we're on now, you know, is it is it relevant, everything we do? And is it, is it, re is it realistic to the game? And do they get a chance to have loads of goals at it? Um, and, and these things are crucial factors. And I think, um, well, George, just, just, you know, on that, as we talked earlier about the, you know, that, that performance gap as well from a physical point of view, you know, adding competitiveness and intensity of games into these small sided areas, whether it's the examples you gave from Argentina and Brazil or this yeah. tournament that we've run, you know, you're really giving the kids the opportunity to develop the, the intensive elements as well as, Obviously, the 11 v 11 game gives us opportunities to develop high speed running because of the recovery runs and the size of the pitch and sprint distances and stuff like that. But you've you've got to blend that in, haven't you? And the other thing that was going through my mind when you were talking as well is this could be this could be a training night as well. It doesn't need to be a tournament. This could be you've got three age groups, four age groups of teams sharing a pitch, and yeah. instead of everybody having a third or a quarter. Yeah. Could, you could actually be training in in this as well and again working on developing those physical returns that are going to help the players to, to kind of fully develop those um, high intensity actions not just on the big areas but also the short sharp act cells d cells change of direction body contacts other things that increase in intensity as they progress through and that's and that's exactly it matt so you know, it's it's uh, an experience that we had uh, as an FA, as members of staff, uh, ho you know, hosting a tournament as part of the uh, previous Advanced Youth Award courses. But you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, it's absolutely fundamental that, you know, the point here is can you adapt it around a, a regular training night? And actually, if you look at the amount of games that, you know, you're playing as a club, um, it, you know, in some cases, as you've alluded to, you know, it might be... Um, it might be, you know, 15, you know, 19, 20 a season. Can you increase uh, the number of game-like minutes that you're getting in training by by moulding this around your, your training week? And and if you've only got half a pitch or a quarter of a pitch, you know, some of the clubs where I work have got a quarter of a pitch. Yes, of course, you won't have access to the full pitch, but can you modify by using the space that you do have slightly more creatively on the nights where you have to share? 
etc uh, etc et cetera. and i think going back to the point about constraints it, 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 this for me is the you know the art of coaching it's where it blends in with um understanding the player the environment and the nature of the strategies that you use or the tasks so you know some constraints might be for example that scoring zone that was uh, on the um, on the original um slide there you know you you can you can use that in a variety of ways you could say if you wanted to be really really constrain them and take away some of their options the players for whatever reason you could say look you you can only score from within that scoring zone for this period of time and um, because you bet your bottom dollar that the opposition will probably drop into a low block and make it really difficult for you to get in there and stay on the ball when you're in there or, or you can tweak it your scoring systems potentially become different where you reward players for having a go at the tactical themes you're going after so for example you know all goals are worth one as they normally would be but if you can score a goal within the scoring zone uh, you know, maybe getting a runner in beyond or a first time finish, you know, it's a bonus goal of two. And what it often does is, again, you know, teams, the defending team will be thinking, well, you know what, we don't want to get hit for two where we might have to drop in low or make it really hard for them. And of course, the attacking team might be running the clock down and they're two one down and they're thinking, well, we haven't got time to, to get one goal to win the game. We need two. The bonus goal requires us to beat the block. So we might have to bump some players on and play with a, an element of calculated risk ahead of the ball to get into that area. So you think about the the overlapping runs at this point from fullbacks and you think about you know midfielders probably playing higher in between the lines and you think about the security behind the ball from your centre halves and keeper uh, and all the physical demands and requirements that come from those uh, that tactical de decision making in order to meet the the constraint that you've placed upon it um i've seen i've seen um uh, we've experimented with you know you have double double tactics almost where uh, you know the defending team you give them maybe 10 seconds to score on the counter from a low block and the number of seconds that are left on the clock at the point where the ball hit, hits the back of the net is the number of goals that they get so if they score in seven seconds obviously it's worth three ten minus seven but at the same time the attacking team are conscious that um you know they've got to try and beat a team that's sat in a low block the numbers of passes that they can make on route to goal and then they score uh, you give them, you give them uh, the equivalent uh, number of goals. So if they make ten passes and score, they score ten goals. But all goals for both teams, normal goals are worth one. So you just promote this decision making where you've actually got a game within a game, and you, you can start introducing that over different size pitches where it has physical responses that the players have got to have got to go with. So um, again, just just to. You know approach the end of this little discussion just some stills for you i mean just regular pictures you've got wolves here in the low block against man united and um you know it's how it relates to these uh you know opening up the 11 11 game where you can have your your tactical work that you need that that that, that you know you'll go through pdp in particular uh, and into the senior game where wolves are in a low block here but of course man united uh you know you look look at the numbers of players that are concentrated in that in that telestrated area you know there's a lot of players in there and and obviously Wolves are closing gaps up and United are trying to bounce the ball and break lines. So lots of numbers in, in small areas. So you think about uh, the technical, tactical responses here, but also think about all the physical stuff, the twisty, turny stuff and the, the um, playing around corners and, and, and what the body needs to be able to do to do that. But you've also got, you know, Wolves showing Man United the sides and it might be overlapping fullbacks who are running over bigger distances, Matt. You know, your 50-yard runs to get beyond the winger so we can get a 2v1 in wide areas and try and prize those Wolves players out and get in behind and penetrate because ultimately that's the principle that we're after. But interestingly, again, you know, Wolves win the ball here and they're looking to counter. So you're looking at, you know, maybe, maybe the outlet pass to an outlet player uh, it might be a 50 60 yard pass I, directly into the space and behind man united's defense so they can get in on goal or it might be a ball into a striker who's got to secure it and wait for his mates to to join in and you've got sprinting over 40 50 yards and the ball turns over and they've got to counter the counter and get back into shape so all the physical stuff that that can come the requirements of the game and how you link that back to um putting the players in these in these particular areas it just links as well doesn't it what we were talking about about using the end in mind thinking about what does the elite game look like and then how are we shaping the practices and the preparation the players to bridge that four corner development so you know what does it look like how how, are you, how often are you pra practicing and training and competing in these areas we saw we seen saw it in these stills but Tuesday we saw it in the the footage that we saw of the of the England women's team as well. Yeah, you know these things are happening in the game all the time, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. 
and I was just looking at you know the the telestration there and then the previous slide with the with with the zoned area. So you know what what size areas are we training on? I mentioned it earlier about you know, your relationships with, with the S and C. So when the ball goes into that that shaded area, there it's, it's very intensive work. So we are working on you know, twisting and returning and using your body to protect the ball. The more yeah. extensive work then is is as the game opens up. So if wolves do break out, then you're ex now you've got your extensive work where they've got to cover cover the ground. Yeah. And like you say, if we're going to expose players to these types of training sessions regularly, then you know that relationship to um to get the measurements right i guess and the numbers right to get the the correct returns you know the again the communication and and, and relationships you have with the, the snc department are, are massive but you know for me it, it's, it's football first isn't it it's football first you know the, what we're getting out of it and then you look at the physical and and and, and um and, yeah. and the and the, 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 the intensive and extensive uh, returns yeah of course the ball as the ball switched as the ball switched um, and you get your 5v4 in wide areas, the capacity to, to bounce the ball out of there to open the pitch up where the bigger areas are to then go and exploit the numbers that you're up against to then penetrate and get, get behind, behind. And then, of course, you get your 1v1 situations, as you see with, with Sterling, where players have to stay on the ball. And, of course, you know games like futsal and five-a-side football and playing in, in tight areas promote staying connected to the ball and waiting for your, waiting for your teammates to turn up uh, to support you. And the strength element of that and the twisty turn, the agility stuff is absolutely fundamental. So so that's important. And I think just to just to sort of finish off this discussion, really, if you go if you can see this uh, you know, presented at the time, you know, four or five years ago, this idea of, you know, what could it look like? I I, I'm, I use an example only, and this is hypothetical. So if you can see it in that context, but where I live, I'm from Leeds myself. Um, you know, and I was thinking of look, um, there's loads of isolated work similar to everything we should shared with you tonight happening um which is absolutely fantastic you know i wonder if we'd ever get to a place where we could join this up and tie it together so you know if you look at the the pro clubs that are sort of within an hour's traveling distance arguably of of, of leeds for example uh, there's some there and and but but of course you've got loads of clubs that are playing at semi-professional levels from conference or national league you know down to sort of uh, counties counties league standard um and and therefore a lot of these teams uh, have access to you know floodlight 3g's and sometimes run college programs where where they have you know good facilities so you know i just thought it'd be, it'd be interesting could we could we expose youngsters if you take the example of an under 12s group at leeds united and in the pro game and then maybe uh an under 13s group in the non-pro game um slightly older then you then you know arguably you'd look at different categories of academies uh, you would look at different size players, different ages, different speeds, di different physical um, uh, properties. Um, you, you know, you, you, you're getting into the bio banding discussion to a degree, um, but also things like travel, traveling time could potentially be a lot less. So, you know, trying to put it into um, an idea of what it might look like. And when I talk about our context, because playing seven days a week, as they do in Brazil and Argentina, and then running home and playing in the streets and all that type of stuff, um, you know, quite clearly doesn't work in, in, in our country. And I think that uh, this is where we've got to, you know, look at the importance of understanding the relationships between all the different departments and what's required for player development. So, you know, for example, you know, if you're training on a Monday, uh, you know, Tuesday, you might think about substituting uh, a training session for uh, a game, if you can get a game. So the example I provided here is, say, Leeds United under 12s, you know, uh, host chef for Wednesday under 12s, um, and play over a certain format, maybe 9v9, 11v11, 7v7 for, for however minutes, uh, however many minutes on the size pitch that they could they can they can host the game on. Um and then Wednesday, you know, potentially have your day off, Thursday it might be mixed format training, uh Friday have your day off, Saturday mixed format training if, if teams are training on a Saturday, and then on the Sunday games program, there could be some uh, exploration around maybe mixing things up so that you know, they get a chance to play in different size areas, you know, whether it's a, a 11 by 11 game and, and, and also, uh, you know, a, a futsal derivative or five side or whatever, or just uh, on, on tighter areas. So just, just this, these were some thoughts, you know, several years ago. And I think you look at the amount of minutes of game time it provides and the uh, and hopefully the lack of extensive travel. And, and also, you know, you get that interaction between pro clubs and non-pro clubs and, kids going through different stages of maturation and um, all yeah. the specific stuff.
certainly adds to the volume and variety of the, of the program doesn't it and yeah when we look at the top of the presentation as well that, that, that we were talking about kind of part of the bridging the gaps thing was about the amount of games that kids are exposed to compared to what it might look like when they get to the end in mind um yeah and this is a you know this on not only does it give them the opportunity to maybe uh, play in the smaller formats as well as the big formats to get that more well-rounded uh, physical development but also you, you're looking at the amount of games and game time um and, and trying to bridge that gap that we saw earlier on in the in the webinar as well 100 percent 100 percent so you know there, there were just some thoughts trying to model some of this stuff around around uh, the environments that we work in and we've experimented with some pro clubs in leeds that have been involved in mixed game formats across 11v11 11 11, 7v7 9v9 and different constraints and and it was a it was a a very good experience with some good feedback so uh, and as matt said it doesn't have to be tournaments obviously it can be your regular training sessions and just exposing kids to uh, the things that they're going to need um uh, at the end game um and i suppose it's always this question of you know what's the balance of, of play uh, versus practice you know do we play enough games are we training uh, over training and under playing or are we under training and over playing um yeah, and I guess it's difficult finding, you know, one way is the right way. I think that's the beauty of our profession that, you know, there's so many different ways to to approach uh, many of these things. It's important to look at different cultures, but also to to look at the best of what we have and just just see how it fits in, in with your with your own context. But understanding the requirements of the game and the modern era at senior elite level, I think is crucial. Um, yes, yeah. thank you. Busy. For you too, I guess. What are your thoughts in terms of bringing this to a close? What would you like your kind of take-home message to be from all of this? Yeah, well, you know, I started with with this slide around the performance and development. And, you know, I, I've written there. You know, even when even when the players are at the performance end of the development, they still need developing. And I think you know that that that's really key in terms of we have to get, we have to strike the balance right between the performance model and, and, and the development model and and maximize the time you can get with these players through all ages and stages of the development so if you're looking at it even at that sentence i wrote down there that's not just your senior players towards the back end of the game you know that's that might be players who are on the verge of of, of, of first team football um but throughout the academies throughout you know uh, senior football i think getting relationships with the, the, the multidisciplinary departments because as you all know it, it's, it's grown loads over over the years when i started i think there was three of us and i think there's went 20 odd staff there now um i think it's all our responsibility to try and maximize the, the players by potential and, and and seek these opportunities to to work them on the grass whether that's games or games or, or training and joe for yourself what would you what would you be the message yeah no just on top of that really from twos i think i think um you know how do we develop the physical capacity in 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 our young players to be ready for uh the requirements of the modern game this intensity and and, and the distances covered and the sprint reps and transitions and everything that's coming with it so you know uh, as we explore different ways as part of our jobs as you know practitioners across ydp and pdp and the game at large you know uh, can we can we take learnings from other countries um, and sprinkle it in with the, some of the best things that we're doing and even things that we've done in our past, uh, you know, to, to really help these youngsters on the journey, build the capacity and the robustness that they're going to need um, to be able to, to, to function at that top, top level. Thank you, guys. Well, that, that brings an end to uh, our webinar uh, at the moment. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it we hope you've taken some things away from it we've left you with some considerations on this final slide so if you want to take a closer look at them you can obviously pause the video and, and, and consider them in more detail as you as you maybe ponder this a little bit more but we hope to see you again on an fa, FA webinar very soon thanks everyone yeah thanks everyone